There's a difference in technique. Uh, I think there's often a difference. You have to share whilst hiding something. Oh, you know, the character still has to be driven by those things in life that are interesting, which is, what do I want? What I hope is going to happen? What am I frightened is going to happen? And, and what am I letting people see of myself? Uh, so the technique's different, but yeah, I tell you that I'm in a play that's a big hit at the moment, and it's very popular, and it's nice that it goes down well with the crowds. I've been in ones which aren't. And when you do a scene that doesn't really work on film, you've got to let it go because it's done. You know, it's one of life's great lessons. So, you know, when, if there's nothing you can do about something, then don't worry about it because you're just harming yourself. When you're in a play and something doesn't work, you've either got a chance to fix it the next day, or if you know it's not going to change, there's the purgatory of arriving at the theatre, seeing all those people who've got a babysitter, put their car in the NCP, you know, they've got a restaurant booked, a big night out for them, and you know you're going to give them some kind of half-baked goods or moments where... There's moments sometimes where everybody reads the program. It's no coincidence when 700 people re reach for the quality street, you know. So theatre can be fantastic. When it works, it's the, easily the best medium of communication that there is. It's re it really is the greatest way of gathering a group of people and communicating. But when it's bad, it's just like stealing time out of people's lives. And if you're responsible for that, it hurts. We used to, and we used to documentaries as well, but we are used to experiencing everything, seeing everything. And nowadays with CGI, there's no budgetary limitations on, on crowds or visceral experiences. So if you're going to have to fill in with your imagination on stage, it better be fucking gripping. It better grip you, not just on a plot level, but on a, some thematic level, something universal. Or else why bother? He's an incredibly funny writer, yeah. There's a great documentary on Pinter called Working with Pinter that was on recently, in which he was asked about his famous pauses and silences. He gets really annoyed about it. He says they're just there to try and help you get the laugh, you know. They're really just there, they're the timing of the scene. A pause is that, that's a pause, you know, or longer, or whatever works for you as an actor. And the silence very often is because someone says something, nobody else knows what to say. There's a really awkward moment. So if the silence doesn't work, cut it. So uh, Pinter, I think, is... You know, much like that great old man of the theatre, Shakespeare, you know, he's just a craftsman with his sleeves rolled up. He might have won the Nobel Prize, but the reason he's Harold Pinter in capital letters, he's a crackingly good storyteller. He was an actor for years. And uh, the dumb way to which we're doing, you know, people are laughing all the way through it, huge laughs, which means when there's a silence, it's pin drop quiet. And when there's a, you know, a shock, there's a big gasp because your emotions are set free. I saw Steppenwolf, the Chicago theatre company that uh, John Malkovich started with Gary Sinise, and I saw them do The Grapes of Wrath at the National Theatre, and it, unbelievably, this is, sounds, sounds ridiculous and very pretentious, but watching that big ensemble cast on stage at the Olivier, which is the big stage of the National Theatre, made me think about a continent starving more than any of the literature I'd seen, more than any of the you know, documentary footage uh, of the Great Depression. I really felt a nation suffering. There was something truly beautiful about it. And, uh, and it had a huge impact, you know, at the time, but afterwards as well, just thinking, trying to understand America and, and the things that have happened to it. And, you know, uh, it, it's ridiculous to think that 35 people on a stage on the South Bank of London could communicate that to me better than, uh, you know, film footage or books, but it, it did. I saw Mark Rylance play Hamlet for the RSC once, and I, I studied Hamlet for A-level, and I, I'm one of those people that uh, make me sick when Shakespeare is on stage, because one of the reasons I haven't done any Shakespeare is I, I can't bear the audiences who come so that they can show off to each other uh, what they remember of their A-levels or their degrees or, or, or what they think of this set compared to the one they saw five years ago. And, uh, and that's what happens mostly to Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare is just a, a good storyteller. And, and I've seen Shakespeare played to audiences who have never seen it before in schools and, and further education colleges and, and, and other places around the country when it's touring. And, and, and they don't, they're not comparing it to something else. They're just responding to the story. You know, 
I saw Mark Rylance do Hammer, and I felt, and I know every single word of it, because I've seen it lots of times, and, and uh, I felt like I'd never heard a word of it before. I, I thought it was improvised. I thought it was improvised comedy, to be honest. It was hilarious, but incredibly upsetting as well. And I, f I thought about parents and children and sisters and power and, and, uh, and awkwardness. There's a moment where Hamlet says, I'm going to pretend to be mad. He says to his mates, his best mates, look, I'm going to try and find out what's going on here if my dad was murdered. So I'm going to pretend to be mad. So don't blow it for me. And it's always seen a bit of a conceit, kind of clever idea, so that he can do it. And he was so brilliant, Mark Rylance. He was so disturbed by grief over losing his dad and him not doing anything about it and feeling like a wimp, feeling like he was a coward. The only th thing that he could have done to allow him to look in anybody else's eyes was pretend to be mad. It was, it was the most obvious psychological choice. And uh, it was amazing. Even now, talking about it, I, I, it was an amazing night in the theatre. And they're pretty rare. Um, I came out of drama school and I almost immediately was in a, a very big television series in England called Capital City years ago about bond dealers and traders in the city. It was a, an amazing break for a young actor and the best education because I, was, I felt after two years I was so comfortable in front of a camera. And I'd seen lots of quite well-known actors come in and do cameos or bits and episodes and be nervous. And really, genuinely, try too hard, I think. And try and do a five-act drama with their two scenes. And, um, you know, that was literally because I was visiting my agent. I was walking through the West End, I popped into the office. And uh, I had a job in Liverpool on stage and I didn't want to go. I come from Liverpool, I didn't want, I didn't want to go back. I just, you know, I, I, I was broke and I, I just didn't want to go. So. I went into the office to complain and she almost kicked me out of my ass and the phone rang and they were casting this series and they'd already seen her clients and they said well we haven't cast these main parts, have you got anyone else? And I could hear it on the speakerphone and she went no, well, you've seen one and I went, I started gesturing wildly at myself and she went, hold on a second, I'll let me take you off speaker, cover the handset, she went, what the fucking matter with you, you've got a job, you signed a contract. I said I know but I, I don't know any casting directors, I could go and meet her, I'm not going to get the job am I? Yeah, all right. Well, I, yes, I, there is one guy I've taken on, the young guy, Jason Isaacs from drama school. And the, the person obviously said down the phone, is he any good? And can he do a Scottish accent? And she went, um, Scottish. And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've been to the Edinburgh Festival a few times, and I have quite a good ear for accents. She went, yeah, yeah, he can do a really good Scottish accent. You're looking at me thinking, you're really going to get me in trouble. And I went and got the job, and I was on telly for two years. And if I hadn't been there, it would never happen. And there's been a few... Uh, opportunities like that. So that was the first, it was a big break for me.